hope this uh, Q&A will be helpful to those of you who are curious about ITP and maybe thinking of applying to our graduate program but don't have a chance to physically come for a visit. We are joined today with two of our amazing faculty members, Catherine Dillon and Tom Igo. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, Catherine's focus is on design and user experience. At ITP, she teaches visual language, persuasion design, and thesis. Uh, she's the creative director at L2 Inc., a digital research firm. Uh, Tom's research, Tom Igo's research, includes physical uh, interaction design, networks, sustainability, and monkeys. He teaches physical computing courses and is the co-founder of the Arduino open source microcontroller. Um, so why don't you guys uh, take a couple minutes and maybe expand on that, uh, talk about your work a little bit? Sure, you wanna go first? Sure, yes, so um, my class visual language is for students who have no design experience, so you don't come to ITP with design experience if you have strong technical um, skills or other skills, uh, neither technical nor design skills, but good ideas, uh, we welcome you to apply. And uh, that class particularly offers students with, without that design experience an opportunity to get some fundamentals in basically graphic design for digital and how it focuses mostly on how you use design tools to communicate ideas and explore ideas. Uh, we're a very collaborative place, so sometimes the language that we use to um, communicate with each other are, are visual language since we're such an international population as well. And then I also teach, um, persuasion design is actually called for de design for change this year because the focus, it is about understanding some of the uh, psychological triggers and behaviors that are fundamental to human nature that we should understand in order to uh, apply those to the ways we want to impact the world, for, hopefully for good, in terms of social change. So we look at social problems and how to move the needle on them at scale using some of these um, behavioral psycho psychology learnings. I also teach a class I'm very passionate about uh, called 100 Days of Making, which flips the traditional model of final projects and the pressure on those on its head. and. Um, ask the students to challenge themselves to iterate on a theme every day for 100 days. And, um, and then a basic course in user experience design and how to introduce the voice of the user in the design process. At the end of the day, we're all designing things for the most part that we hope other people will use to enrich their lives or experiences. So we need to make sure that they're part of that design process. And then lastly, as Midori said, thesis, which uh, for me is a fantastic opportunity to see students both on their way in for a semester with visual language and then see all the amazing things they learned and accomplished on their way out through their thesis project. Uh, so I teach physical computing, uh, which is a, our core class that really introduces people to the idea that you can't interact with computers or digital systems without some sort of uh, physical body for the machine because you have a body. And we often focus so much on the software that we forget that there is a limit to how much we can express through computers and through uh, electronic devices, and that limit is based on how many senses we give them. So the more uh, the machine can read our actions, the more it can interpret of our expression. Um, we also use that as a class to really teach students what a computer is going all the way down. So we're using a very basic computer so they really do learn what it is without an operating system and all the way up. Uh, I also teach a class called Understanding Networks where the focus is really on understanding networks. Um, I'm not so creative with the names. Uh, because I think it's important that students really do have a, a deeper understanding of how all these telecommunications networks we use work because they affect our lives and they, they uh, can control our lives if we don't understand them enough to make our own choices. Um, and then on top of that I'll teach other classes from time to time around one or two of these themes, um, either something on um, physical computing or something combining uh, electronics with network devices. Uh, occasionally I've taught classes on uh, sustainability and technology. And uh, though I'm not doing it at the moment, I've also taught classes where we take some of the work I'm doing working with uh, primatology researchers and use it as an interaction design challenge to say, these are folks who work in extreme situations how can we use what they do as a way to learn to build the tools that they need? Great. Um, so can you take a couple moments and describe what the environment is like at ITP? 
Oh boy, um, it's, well, Dan O'Sullivan, who's our chair, likes to describe it as sort of a creative mess, I think. Um, it's, a, it's a very open space, which means there's a lot of people sort of working next to each other or on top of each other. Um, it's very much a, a studio space uh, in that there's plenty of open workspace and um, tools to work with and uh, you know, walls where you can just kind of get up and put something on the wall or draw or things like that. Uh, because we want to give people room to um, to have ideas, and, and again, ideas that affect physical space as well as uh, network telecommunication space. Um, it's a very social place. I think people tend to spend a lot of time chatting with each other or in the middle of working on something saying, hey, is anybody know how to do such and such? And that's something we really try to encourage. Yeah. I just would second that and say the students learn as much here from each other as they do from us, certainly, probably more. Uh, very much of a collaborative, uh, social, making kind of environment here. Yeah, what's Dan's other line? It's uh, the class is really an excuse to be hanging out in the hallway, <laughs> um, and that's really does tend to work that way here a lot. Great. Um, and um, what kind of applicant, in your opinion, makes the best? kind of student at ITP? I think someone who's curious, um, passionate about ideas and possibilities. Um, I think students who come with a particular focus of that passion tend to um, succeed here, you know, whether it's education or healthcare or a, a traditional art practice or whatever it is. Um, but students who really um, are know that the world uh, can be a better place, know that, that all the things that um, can be invented haven't been invented yet, and that there's lots of opportunity with the right tool set to experiment and push ideas forward. Having said that, we do find that students who think they're going to come and, you know, they are going to be a documentary maker, they've been a documentary maker, they take, you know, understanding networks, and um, there's lots of changing and morphing of ideas, which is part of the magic here, too. So I don't want to suggest that people sort of come with a specialty and, and hone that specialty, that specialty all, all, often leads them to other places that they would never have anticipated. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think, and it's funny because you mentioned that, we did, did actually have somebody who came as a documentary maker, took Understanding Networks, and now he's running a telephone company in <laughs> Nicaragua. So, um, you know, things take different paths. I think that if there's anything that really makes people um, successful here, is that they uh, they do uh, want to explore things through building through trying to, um, to uh, practice it and that um, they like working with people and that may sound trite but I think a lot of times uh, particularly in, in our design schools you, you often get students who have a vision they just want someone to help them, from, them craft that vision and eh, they're not so necessarily worried about working with other people um, I think our best students here are people who they genuinely like each other, and they genuinely ask each other questions and will help each other out. Um, they're not necessarily extroverts, but they are the type that'll say, oh yeah, no, I can help you with that. What, what do you need? Okay. Uh, James online asks, uh, can you talk about the range of technical backgrounds of, of your students? Oh boy, range is the right word because it's everything from you know, in my case, have never opened Photoshop, um, you know, no coding experience whatsoever to, I, I think every year we have a few that are fairly sophisticated on uh, both, uh, with the, both the design tools and the um, software tools, uh, coding skills. But by no means are they the norm. It's, it's very much of a wide range. And that's sort of where that whole collaborative notion, people bring their particular um, expertise in it and, the sharing of the knowledge sharing is really uh, the secret sauce around here. I'd say. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that the two of us are in this conversation right now because we do represent two parts of uh, the technique that's done around mm -hmm. here that people often don't recognize that the other side is a technique, right? Um, but I think what's really fun in class is when you get someone who they think they know everything about a particular area and then they get introduced to an entirely different set of practice and they go. Well, that's kind of interesting. I want to mess around with that. Um, I, uh, I was thinking of a couple of, of our alums that we were working with, Nick Sears and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, John Cousins, who came in with strong electrical engineering backgrounds, 
and walked out of here doing design work. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, those are the kinds of things we like to see. But yeah, it is really a wide range. Um, and yeah. not just art or science, but uh, sociology, anthropology, politics, business, you name it, we see them come through. Yeah. And it's, there is no typical, so there is no mold we're trying to fill, but just interesting people with interesting experiences that they bring. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do your alumni do after they graduate? Oh, That's as hard as answering what they do, what the students yeah, are. Yeah, it, it's such a, there, again, there is no typical. Uh, some pursue a traditional art practice, some, um, we've had a number of people very successful in education, in the education field and bringing you know, disruption and fresh ideas to that. Um, we've had people focus on healthcare issues. Some, uh, you know, end up at the obvious places, Google, Facebook, Amazon. Um, some go the agency route. A lot of entrepreneurial ship comes out of here. People, <laughs> I think we expose people to sort of what it's like to be inventors and makers and that's really contagious and compelling and so a lot of people do like to pursue that when they leave and there's some wonderful success stories around that. So there again, there's nothing typical about who comes in or what, what they do when they go out, which is, again, what makes for such a rich place. Mm, yeah, I, I think Dan was saying yesterday that uh, he was doing a, a look at stuff on LinkedIn from alums and um, that the most common dis job description people had was co-founder but not necessarily mm -hmm. co-founder in the, the currently in vogue entrepreneurial way. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who maybe started small agencies of two or three people because they like working together and they have shared clients. Yeah. Um, and I think we see that agencies in a lot of different areas, both, both design, both um, uh, construction, uh, in strategy, all kinds of areas. Yeah. And one of the nice things about the alumni network, because we're so international in terms of our student population, People also leave with just a network of colleagues and friends literally from all over the world, which is fantastic also. Mm, they tend to hire each other a lot too. Yeah. Yeah, on, on that front, uh, in terms of international students, I think we have about 60% um, international this year, mm -hmm. uh, representing anywhere from like 20 to 25 different countries. So ITP really is coming from all over the place, and so we really um, you know, embrace that diversity. That said, we're also, I think, what was it, like 55% women this yes, year? Yes, so. so, yeah, I think maybe 55, 60% women. So we're one of the few um, sort of more technical programs that, that have more women. So that's, that's a great uh, plus for us as well. Um, so Louise online asks, uh, can you talk about the projects in your classes? Are there many small projects and challenges or more one large project that you work on throughout the semester? So I think depending on the class, it's all of the above. Um, as I mentioned, my 100 days class, it's 100 projects. Um, in my visual language class, it's a seven week class. We do a, an assignment each week that applies the principles. Some of the design for change, we do a number of short projects and then there is a final project that's six weeks long. The one class where there is a full semester focus on a final project is um, thesis, which is uh, one of the few classes where the project is independent. Otherwise, most of the final projects were, are teamwork or some sort of, have some kind of collaboration element to it. So it's, it's de depending on the choice of class, that there's no formula for what the project structure is. Yeah, I mean, I think you could probably say with a lot of the production classes, you may end up be, being working on anywhere from, say, two to five projects during exactly. the course of a semester. And I think one of the things that's actually really satisfying to me that we see is oftentimes students have something they want to work on and they find a way to sort of shoehorn it into the assignment for three or four different classes. Um, and one thing we've started to notice the last couple of years and I think encourage um, is like we'll see people taking intro to physical computing and they're working on a device or something and at the same time they're taking intro to computational media and they're working on the software that connects to that device in there and then at the same time they're taking um, uh, Comlab uh, audio video and they're shooting the videos for the thing they're building in that class and you were saying earlier that you've got people in visual language who are working on some poster designs for the show coming up so we actually really like to see those things where students realize that the classes can actually serve an idea from many different facets. 
Um, and then what what's the uh, um, in terms of the projects are they group projects or individual projects? Uh, again, that's all of the above. Yes, some are group and. Sometimes the groups are assigned by the faculty, sometimes the professor of the particular class, sometimes you, the groups form organically within the class, and some projects are individual, but it's, there's no typical, it, it's, anyone who graduates here will have done some number of individual exercises, some number of group projects of their own choosing, and some that they were, um, you know, there was an arranged marriage of a team of some sort. But the groups typically, I think, are sort of three or four. It's somewhat unusual for a group project to be bigger than that, though again, like I'm thinking of the time Square Project last oh, semester God, yeah. was the entire class. So um, we're really not, it, it, if there's one thing that defines ITP, it is there is no formula for the way that we do things, that depending on the particular circumstance, subject matter, the class dynamic, um, we're certainly flexible enough to do whatever feels right in terms of accomplishing the academic goals. Yeah. Okay, and then James asks, uh, how are the classes tailored for the range of design and technical backgrounds of the students so that they are challenging for everyone? What about the range of backgrounds inside of one class? Well, usually what we find with the classes um, is that uh, no one class is focusing so tightly on one technique that everybody in the class um, has to do just that one thing. So even in a class that may be heavily skewed one direction, you usually find that people who've already done that skill still find something that challenges them. Like uh, again, in physical computing, we do a little bit of electronics, but we also do some software and we do some fabrication. And students will have one or two of those skills, but maybe not all. I think another thing that they really uh, find is a challenge, um, and a good one, is that when you are working on a group project like we were talking about, you often have to help your partners understand what your skills are and what you're bringing to the table. So in, again, in the class that, uh, that I'm teaching right now, it's often the case that one person will understand the electronics really well, another will re understand the software really well, and a third will understand the design really well. And so in working together, they, they end up sort of teaching each other the skills as a group, as well as learning from each other as they go. I think that's pretty typical with a lot of classes mm -hmm. around here, yeah. yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, let's see here. And how many um, students join the program each year? And what's the, uh, the student-teacher ratio? Well, classes are limited to, with the exception of applications, which is the one class that the entire class takes in their first semester, the first year, the classes are limited to 16. So it's a very tight student to faculty ratio. And all of us as faculty have office hours and are very much in the mix in terms of this creative mess that we call the, the fourth floor here. So um, people are very accessible. Students all have academic advisors um, to help them with their class choices. And uh, to, just to the previous question, after your first semester, uh, first semester courses are fairly prescri subscribed, prescribed, um, but after that you have a lot of choice, you have nothing but choice in terms of what you take with the exception of thesis in your last semester. So in terms of choosing your path, there's lots of options of classes and you can really craft your own curriculum here after the first semester. Yeah, in terms of total numbers, um, we take about 110 to 115 mm -hmm. per class, ter per cohort, and we have two years going at any given time, so there's typically about 220, 230 students here. There's about a dozen of us on full-time faculty, uh, 50 to 60 adjuncts, depending on the semester, um, and then we also have research residents, there's about a dozen of them, and uh, staff is uh, probably about uh, eight or nine at this point, I think, is that right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people around to help. And what are you guys most excited about for this coming year at ITP? We've been in semester now for a month, um, so I don't know if it's new technologies or new ideas. What What's going on here that you're most excited about? You know, I, I would say, I mean, one of the fantastic things about teaching here is that every year is a new beginning. Every class has its own personality and talents, and so, you know, I, I do, tend to hear the word virtual reality a lot. Um, every year there's sort of some one word that seems to emerge as, as the 
you hear bouncing off the walls a bit, but there isn't any one thing that I'd say I'm excited about, just sort of like what this class, and I'm you know, seeing how excited they are to be here, how hard they're working, just looking forward to seeing what what's gonna come out of their brains, you know, in all sorts of ways. So I wouldn't say it's any, we, we try very much not to push any one technology or be a sort of flavor of the month around what's popular, but um, there, you know, there are all sorts of interesting ideas that are always in the mix here. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true, I think. I think for me, if there's one thing that's exciting about this year, I was, I was away last uh, spread, semester, so it's nice to be back, and uh, especially given what's going on in the world right now, what's really enjoyable about being here is there's a huge amount of idealism. Mm -hmm. um, and I see students, so many students here, who don't just want to learn how to do something, but really to understand why and how to make the world better using the things they're making. Um, and so we have discussions in class where we'll shift from talking about, say, Ohm's Law to, well, what do we do about disability, somebody's disability and how we make them feel included? And, you know, it can feel like intellectual whiplash shifting from one to another, but it's great because it, you get people who immediately are saying, this is going to matter to somebody if I do my job right, and that's really great. I like to see that. Okay, Louise online asks, uh, how does signing up for classes work? Is it possible to get all of the classes you want, or what are the chances? No. <laughs> um, so the sign up for classes is, there's actually kind of two versions of it. For first year students, you're going to get all the classes you need because you've got to take the intro classes, and we make sure there's enough sections. The advanced classes are fairly idiosyncratic, and they really tend to be we hire uh, faculty or adjuncts because they've got something special to offer the students. And so if we run a class, it's difficult to run a second section of it because there's only that one person who knows that stuff. So what we do with the sign up is a little different than the rest of the university does. We, give, uh, we have a system where everybody puts in their preferences and then the system tries to fill everybody's first choice first. And if they don't get their first choice, they're pushed to the front of the line for their second choice. Um, so I would say most people end up getting you know, between 60 to 75 percent of what they want on a good year. But the other thing that really happens is they'll, they'll say, well, I didn't expect that I was going to like this class that was my fourth choice, but it turned out to be my best class. Um, I think if there's one refrain we hear all the time was, oh, there's about three classes I never got around to taking, I really wish I could have taken. Um, so it's a process that seems when you're in the midst of it, like, oh my god, I'm never going to get everything, and then you get your class and you're like, oh my god, I get everything. <laughs> okay. Um, Bogdan asks, um, is there an opportunity of taking uh, an internship during the program? If so, what are the typical companies and industries? Uh, yes, most definitely. I'm of the personal opinion that internships are great in the summer, but when you're here, there's only you know, 16 classes you're going to take, and so internships, uh, because they're for credit, I think for the international students they have to be for credit if I'm not mistaken, yeah. so they do sort of detract from your academic opportunity, but um, having said that, you know, s there are students who have benefited tremendously from wonderful uh, work experience, uh, particularly students who, who have not worked, who come directly from college, um, which is the exception. Most students here do have work experience. And um, we have a lot of companies, Midori can speak to this, who reach out to us looking for interns. Those are posted to the list. And so there's no formal process in terms of, you know, every year Company X takes, you know, five ITP interns, whatever it is. It is the students have to sort of have some initiative on their own in terms of securing those interns. But certainly uh, internships are possible. And I don't know what the percentage is. I would say maybe, I don't know. 10%, something like that. It's a smaller percentage, a relatively small percentage, but internships definitely are possible. And summer, um, between the two years, is definitely a great opportunity for getting some professional experience in exploring. And um, ITP has a fantastic reputation, and we just had a, um, a flyby where the second years shared with the first years all the things they had done over the summer, and it was an incredibly impressive array of opportunities and you know just really exciting to see the kinds of experiences that our first-year students had over their summer 
Yeah, I'd say the, the, the number of people who take internships during the summer is actually probably a lot higher than oh, 10%, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and many times, if they're not doing it uh, for credit, they're still doing what seems like an internship because they're learning something mm -hmm. on the job in that sense. Um, and in terms of the range of companies, we see a lot of uh, we see a lot of exhibit design, we see a lot of communication design, we see people going for some of the sort of big tech companies, Google, Facebook, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, we see them doing internships sometimes in government. Uh, we've seen them go into education programs. Um, we had three or four at the UN this we had summer. Few, yeah, yeah, um, and. I think a lot of times the students who had success with internships have come to one of us on faculty and just said, I'm kind of interested in this area, where should I go look? And we'll sort of point them to uh, you know, a dozen companies they should talk to. Great. Um, so we have a couple questions about um, taking classes outside of ITP, um, like the computer science department or game center. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, uh, definitely doable. Students do it all the time. Um, there's just paperwork that needs to be filled out and I think permission from the department that you're going to, so some logistics, but by all means, particularly the Game Center and some of the things happening over at the engineering school that has a new name that I can't remember. Tandon. Tandon, Tandon. Tandon. thank you. Um, uh, so very doable. I think technically there's a credit limit of the number of courses outside. Um, but you know, if there's an argument to be made, if there's sort of exceptions to those uh, restrictions as well. Um, I think most students come in thinking they're going to take advantage, and we do encourage it. I mean, it is great to be part of the broader Tisch community or the Tenon community or, the, or wherever, whatever um, uh, department you're interested in, but I think people generally do find the offer of classes here are too tempting to give up to go elsewhere, but definitely, uh, at least with my adv advisees, I encourage them to at least explore those options because it does enrich their broader NYU experience. Yeah, same here. I, and I'd say we've also seen a good number who think they're going to take some outside classes but then end up collaborating with someone from dance or from film or something right. like that. And they have a great time and they go, I don't need to spend a class of credit <laughs> on that. I'm just going to do this project with this person because it's great. So we, we encourage that kind of thinking too. Okay. Uh, Lauren asks, how do you apply that mission-driven perspective and idealism to classes? Is there a practical application of, the, of those ideas in the assignments? Oh, definitely. Lauren. Very much so. I mean, Design for Change, which I can speak to, is uh, I just, we just discussed the final project, which is to first identify a problem. Because um, one thing we do is try to encourage students not to run to solutions, but really understand the problem first. So they're to select a uh, a social issue um, that they're passionate about and understand sort of where the uh, pro pain points are around that issue and um, uh, the only constraints on the assignment are it has to be an issue at scale so not solving personal behavior issues you know I want to quit smoking but how you know <laughs> at a broader societal level and then we will um, uh, in teams of two in this case they will explore the issue and identify solutions for it, and then hopefully um, uh, also included in the process is an opportunity to really test ideas and make sure that they aren't just all pie in the sky, but try them in front of uh, some subset of uh, the population to which the um, problem is an issue. Yeah, and I think you'd see in, all, in all, almost all of our classes there is a, a sense of that idealism. We um, Even in the most technical classes, I think we tend to look for projects that are going to get students thinking about how to apply it to their world. So, you know, in a programming class you may have someone who's trying to figure out, um, Sharon De La Cruz's project is a good example oh, yeah. of this. Uh, she ended up working on a project in a programming class um, that was a tool to help uh, advocates of um, children who were being brought in, smuggled in as illegal immigrants, to help them with their legal advocacy. Um, both with language issues and with uh, getting the kids to communicate in a way that they felt safe. So we see a lot of projects like that. Um, we also will often pick classes around a particular theme uh, so that we've got something to hang the ideas on. Um, we have a guest, uh, Mark Abbey. Hello, Mark. He's, Hi, Mark. he's an alum. <laughs> he wants to know what did you eat for breakfast? 
Um, but that also goes into the, the, the whole part about community and the amount of food that we have and what brings people together. So maybe yeah. you can speak about that a little bit. And also, what did you eat for breakfast? <laughs> huh. I don't think I had breakfast. I yeah. should get some breakfast. That's <laughs> I a had good a New point. York bagel. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it does speak to the, the, uh, the community. I mean, we, um, you often find that people show up here and kind of stay the entire day partially because they've got things they want to do, but partially because it's more pleasant to be than where they might elsewhere be. And so we've tried to make the place pleasant by providing a kitchen and, uh, you know, occasionally providing healthy snacks and things like that. Um, that's Pizza a relatively new innovation, I think, the healthy snack thing, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I think Mark can <laughs> attest to this, but I think ITP does become a hard place to leave after two years. I hear that a lot from students because it really does become their broader family and uh, it is very much a place where you do want to commit to, when you come here to commit to being here because the value of it is the experience outside the classroom and doing your work here on the floor versus home in your apartment so I encourage applicants to consider that as, as that when they're coming here they really um, should be making a commitment to, to be here in terms of doing their work here. Mm. Okay, um, and James asks, uh, what about entrepreneurship? Do graduates start their own companies? Definitely. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, and again, I think the types of companies they start may be a little different than, than the tech press is promoting as sort of the cliche right now, mm -hmm. too. You know, we've, we've certainly seen a few that are, um, that are, you know, sort of the quick growth kind of things. Uh, Foursquare started here. Uh, there's a company called OpenTrons that started here recently. Um, but we also see a lot of companies that start a, a, and continuous, uh, essentially small businesses. Um, uh, Brooklyn Research, mm -hmm. uh, Cousins and Sears, yeah. Vidcode, so um, the thing that Sebastian Weiss and Nian are doing, um, I'm forgetting what they call the company. But so there's a lot of that kind of thing that happens. Um, and I, I think one of the things we really um, encourage here at ITP is to think not just about scale, but think about what the right scale is. Sometimes the right thing for you in running a company is not to be running a world dominating company, but to running something that serves a certain number of clients at a scale you can relate to that's also economically sustainable. Yeah, and uh, NYU also has great resources for people looking to pursue entrepreneurship. The Leslie E Lab, um, uh, which is you know, specifically for entrepreneurs for all of NYU. And also, we tend to collaborate with the Stern School of Business. You know, they have the uh, the business plan competition. Mm -hmm. um, Which we many times now. right, <laughs> many of our students have entered that and have won, um, which is a great thing. Um, and some grant opportunities too, out of, yeah, of which that is so. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Nahil Nahil uh, asks. I think we talked about alumni previously, but um, after students graduate from the program, where do they typically go? Uh, what kind of jobs do they typically get and in which industries? Everywhere. Um, we, if, if there are clusters, I would say we see some clusters around exhibit design. We see some clusters around communications in general. So whether that's uh, doing sort of web and interaction design or whether that's helping companies figure out how to communicate what it is they do to a broader audience. We see a good number of people going to education. Uh, we see some people start their own uh, art careers mm -hmm. or design careers. Um, we've had one or two people go into, I know, one or two Buddhist monks we've had. Um, didn't come out of a class necessarily. <laughs> um, so really it's kind of all over the place. Oh, there was a shipbuilder too. Uh, we've had a few people go into assistive technologies. Mm -hmm. Am I missing anything? Mm, this is covered like yeah. all over the teachers. <coughs> okay. Um, anything else? Parting words that you wanna you wanna add or uh, I don't know. No, I, I would just say I've I've been here. I started adjunct in two thousand seven, so five years roughly is adjunct and five years is full time. And I just every day I feel grateful for the opportunity to be here and to be part of this fantastic community. Yeah, I would agree. I came here as a student in ninety five, and I <laughs> sort of forgot to leave. Um, and it's it's Still that here. kind of a place. Uh, and and it's. And it's still fun to come to work every day. And I think that's, if there's one thing that typifies this place for me is that everybody I work with are people I like working with and that are excited about what they do. And 
I feel like if that's one thing we can impart to the students, that's what we're doing our job and that's what we aim for. Great. Uh, well, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, if you are interested in applying to the program, you can find the application link on our website. Um, any questions, you can also email me at itp.admissions at nyu.edu. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, our next Facebook Live uh, interview will be next Friday, October 21st, uh, with Dan Schiffman and Nancy Heckinger. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.